Hello, my name is Mario. Welcome to another video. In today's episode, I will be sharing with you a tip for building microservices in Go, specifically caching using Memcached. The content of this video is basically two things, the introduction to the project and the actual demo itself. The project consists of using or rather building a web service is using the IMDB datasets, specifically the name dataset, is using PostgreSQL for as a data store, and obviously is using Memcached. All the code that you're going to be seeing right now is available on GitHub. The link is in the description as well. There is a readme that you can use for following and running all the day, all the all the servers that you need for running running the example. I'm specifically giving you some instructions for using docker you don't have to use a docker but if you want um, you can do it but if you also have a server available that you can use for running as doc uh, postgres and memcached you can feel free to use that as well so what i'm doing right now is i'm running two containers that are one for postgres and one for memcached what is coming what is next is loading testing data but before that we actually need to migrate and because there is a migration that we have to build well actually there's a table that we have to build uh, before reloading the data now like i said the data is coming from the imdb data sets like i said the names table the names data set rather so we need to create a migration we need to create a table for that specific data set what I'm going to be doing for loading the data is using a tool that I built. It was part of implementing complex pipelines in Go, a blog series that I posted on my channel. Feel free to, to read it if you want it. It's available right here. If you are curious, I post all the instructions. Uh, it's five, only five uh, blog posts that describe how to build uh, complex pipelines. My brain context is Literally, the, at the end is um, data uh, an, uh, uh, command tool, a CLI for loading data. You can install it using this instruction. I already did, so everything is already loaded. Um, sorry, not loaded, but uh, everything is already available uh, on my path. So it should be available in a few minutes. Sadly, the, the tool that I built, it doesn't have an indicator for how much uh, process it has been made made so there is no way to see if it's making any progress at all but trust me it is so let's wait a little bit and you will notice that it will complete in a few minutes and it finished so the tool took about two minutes to complete after that if you use any database manager or any data on any way to access your data your database you will notice that all the data is already available i'm specifically using table plus in this case and you will notice there is a table called names that happens to include all the data available from that data set all right let's jump into the actual code the code like i said is on github the link is in the description there are three files there is a server file a postgres CQ, a PostgreSQL file and a memcached file. As you can imagine, the server is used for describing and implementing the HTTP server, the actual web service that happens to be using Postgres and memcached in the code as well. PostgreSQL is the one implementing the connectivity to the database and the actual SQL statement that is going to be used for pulling the values from the database for querying the actual records. And memcached is the one that is used for getting and setting the value from memcached. In server, we implemented an endpoint called names that happens to receive ID. And that ID is actually going to be used as the key for caching and querying the value that happens to that is going to be used for returning the data itself. We're going to be using we are using Gorilla Mocks as the router, not the standard library, but if you want you can use the standard library as well. The way the route is implemented is pretty straightforward. There is a, a get name that happens to use the client from memcached. If the value exists, it, return, it is returned back to the user. If it doesn't exist, we query the database and then we set it. That's sort of the process that we have to follow when using memcached. We have some sort of a, a step where we're retrieving the value from the database. If 
and only if the value was not already available in the cache. So we query the cache, we query the database, and then we set it in the, in the cache, okay? Like I was mentioning, in Postgres is pretty straightforward SQL code, nothing, nothing really crazy. What is interesting about the actual memcached file and the way this package works is that in order to save the data into memcached, you need to convert whatever you're trying to save into an, a, an array of or a slice of bytes. And for doing that, we're using the encoding gob package that is included in the standard library. The usage is pretty straightforward. It's just super simple. If you use any of the I/O um, if you use the IO package and you use the, any of the reader or writer or the J JSON Marshall or the JSON encoder, it's pretty much the same. Behind the scenes, it converts, it converts whatever data structure or type or of value that you need to convert into a slice of bytes. And this is what we're doing right here. In the context of get, we're decoding the value that we are getting from memcached and converting that to the actual type that we are supposed to be returning, which is name. The opposite happens when using the set name. It converts what we're receiving into a, a slice of bytes that then we set into memcached. What is important about setting or calling the set method is that we need to specify an expiration time. That expiration for this particular example, which is 25 seconds, is an arbitrary value. When we are building a real-time microservice, we need to consider how long we need to keep that value in cache. It could be a day, it could be a few hours, or perhaps we keep it forever and we only invalidate it after knowing that they actually ch the value change on the original side of the data. Like for example, if for whatever reason we have some sort of like a CRUD API, we can cache the get, but when the value updates via the post or maybe put depending on our, the API, we can go and invalidate the value and then refresh it when we're, whenever we receive a new request to that specific value for getting the data. So that's something to keep in mind. Not only that is that, not only that, but we also need to consider about um, keys that happen to be popular, also known as hot keys. There are cases where Perhaps one of the records as is extremely popular and it's always been requested. Perhaps in those cases, it makes sense to have an extra in-process cache that is in memory, uh, specific or local to the process that is r r using that data. In this case, will be the HTTP server before going to the actual remote distributed memcached D server. Again, things to consider when using it. So in practice, when we are running this, we are going to be, again, following the instruction uh, that I have right here for running the server, which is specifically here. And that will be using environment variables for configuring the both the Postgres database and the memcached for connecting locally or remote, depending how the configuration is. And after we run it, what we're going to be doing is hitting the endpoint that we did before using curl. And if you notice what I'm passing in or here in the first, in the ID is an actual value that is in the database. Like this, in this case will be Fred as there. Okay. And I want you to, uh, if you were curious and you saw the migration, the actual migration itself, you will notice that uh, it doesn't have an index. And that is intentional because I want to show you although we could have improved already using an index, the other way is using a caching mechanism, in this case, memcached. You still need to add the primary key and the, primary key and the index, obviously. But consider this in, in, in a case where it's not only pulling values from the database, like by an ID, but more doing some sort of like a expensive calculation or computation. You can cache that result in memory, in memcached. So again, we're going to be using the Fredas there. A code um, and then hit the endpoint and you will notice how slow it is right now it's not even completed but it's trying and trying and it's finally completed so it took me seven seconds to complete now if I go and hit the endpoint one more time it will be faster it actually took 29 milliseconds and that is because everything is already cached in memory the way, if you remember, the way we're caching this information is using the ID. So if I go and hit a different ID, 
it is going to be slow again and that is important to keep in mind now if i try and hit the end point one more time you will notice how fast this was so that's basically the way memcached works obviously when using it in production in real life we need to consider the things i mentioned before one of them is think about the hotkeys do we need to perhaps have a local cache that happens to be next to this the process in this case the http server or do we even do we need to perhaps find a, a different way to cache the values what is the idea that we are going to be using when caching the results and more importantly how we are going to be invalidating those values are we going to be using perhaps an automatic expiration or are we going to be using some sort of explicit invalidation that is triggered through a different maybe an endpoint maybe an event those are really important things to keep in mind when using memcached and in general when using any caching mechanism and that's it for this video thank you for watching and i will talk to you in a different episode i will share with you different tips for building microservices in go in a different time in the near future until then keep it up don't give up see you